Well, good morning. It's great to be with each and every one of you here today in person and online. Again, my name is Ryan Jeffco, and I've had the privilege of being the student pastor here for the past almost three years at the Point Church at Signal. I've been in vocational ministry for almost seven years, and I, I don't think I could put quite into words the gratitude I'm feeling for this opportunity to open up God's Word and preach it to the best of my ability. And I, I want to preface this by saying this, and the students in the room know I usually say this every time we get together, that as much as this message is going to be for you, this message is equally for me. I'm, I'm not going to be someone who preaches at you, but I'm going to be someone who preaches with you and converses with you. Um, you know, I've had the uh, distinct privilege of getting to work alongside Pastor Sam and Pastor uh, Greg for a couple years now, and what we have been so excited to see in these last couple years is the organic growth that we're witnessing within the student ministry. From when we first started to where we are now, it is nothing short of God's abundant grace and sufficient love for each and every one of us, and we're, me personally, I'm, I'm just not trying to mess it up. I'm just, I don't want to get in his way, I don't want to cause any hindrances, but what I want to do is celebrate the good things that the Lord is doing in our student ministry and I'm planning for many years to be in the student ministry I'm convinced my tombstone is going to read death by lock-in and you know our, our goal here as a church is to reach one percent of the greater Chattanooga area by 2030 well I have a more specific get, uh, goal I am hoping that I can reach one percent of the greater Chattanooga to chaperone those lock-ins okay so I'm a little bit behind so if you don't mind there's a sign-up sheet for the next couple lock-ins that we have planned if you will fill that out I would greatly appreciate that our title this morning is God's model for family discipleship so if you have a, a copy of God's Word we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 6 our heart here at the Point Church of Signal and Red Bank Baptist is for families we have a burden for the families that reside in our, in our church on a regular basis and the, and the families that meet occasionally here with us online or, or for the first time families that are visiting with us today. Our burden is for the families. The organic growth that we have been able to witness here since I've been here has been nothing short of amazing and we're, we're abundantly grateful for that. What we want to remind you is that God's model for family discipleship is His model. It's not ours. We don't get to decide what we pick and choose on what we agree with or what we want or what we don't want. This model is meant for our good pleasure and our joy and ultimately for his honor and for his glory. The number of families that are here today in different sizes of quantity obtain unique gifts and abilities that make the Point Church a signal what it is today. And I want to encourage you here today that you are needed and you are wanted by the gifts and abilities that you have obtained by our good and perfect Father. And because of those gifts and abilities, you make what the Point Church's signal is designed to be, and therefore have created a culture today, and hopefully in the future, for more families who have yet to find a place that they call home, that they can come here and feel welcomed, loved, and valued and ultimately hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now today's lesson, I will be unapologetically speaking to the moms and dads in our congregation today or online. Before I, I continue though, I want to preface that if you're, not, if you're here today and you don't, you're not a mom, and a, fa- or a mom and a dad, I want to encourage you that this message is still going to be for you. Our takeaway today is family discipleship demands the entire family. I think we would all agree that, by and large, as a whole, our church it consists of sinful, broken people. Would you agree? Absolutely. And therefore, because of that, we are all coming in here bearing a unique weight that we are all challenged to drop at the feet of Jesus. Some of us are walking in today, going through the deepest of valleys, and others are here today after walking through the highest of mountaintops. I'd love to encourage you to understand that each moment that you have had with the Holy Spirit and each lesson that you have learned from those moments is vital to the growth and the cultivating of this church. Will you continue to share what God is doing in your personal life 
for the betterment of this congregation. I encourage you to do that. And like I said, although I'm going to be unapologetically speaking primarily to the moms and dads of this group, I want to give you a couple caveats on how those who are not moms and dads can still be vitally important to this lesson and to this church. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we got to celebrate a wonderful occasion called Baby Dedication. We had two beautiful families celebrating the miracle of birth and welcoming in a new member of their family, not only immediately, but also to this church family. Through the conversations of our pastor Sam, he initiated charges to those parents to uphold and lift up those babies to live in a manner that is honor and glorifying to God, to which they said yes. And then in that moment of dedication, he turned to the church. He did not specifically and purposefully ask for only the parents to respond to the charge, but he reached out to the whole congregation, whether you're a child, a student, a single man or woman, or a husband and a wife without children, and asked you, will you step into these families' lives, walk alongside them, and uphold the same charges that we are asking of these parents, to which everyone in this room unanimously said yes. There alone is a role that you can play outside of being a mom and dad. Secondly, last week we celebrated eight seniors who are a part of our student ministry, completing a chapter in their life in the student ministry and excited to have this summer before they go off into their next chapter of life that God is pinning. Whether that looks like college, local, or far, whether that looks like career, voca- uh, career starting now or in trade school, all the while, all eight of those seniors, I believe, would agree that outside of their mom and dad, many that reside in this church who were specifically not moms and dads, have poured into their lives to cultivate these young men and women to become who they are meant to become and to be better prepared for the things that lie ahead. There in itself lies another opportunity for those who are not moms and dads to play a vital role in this church. And last but certainly not least, you know our family. We have Hadley, who is three years old, and Luke, who has just turned two. Prior to coming to the Point Church of Signal, we were at a church who, in our demographic, our stage of life was very minuscule in the attendance that participated in the congregation. So much so, it was my family and one other family that were walking through the same life challenges, the same difficulties, and the same successes that we were experiencing, but we had very little people to celebrate that with. We have now come into a church that is filled with many people who are walking in the same life that we are walking in right now who have come to become some of our best friends. And Hadley and Luke are being able to be loved on, prayed for, and Christ-led by children in this ministry, students in the student ministry, and adults within this church who are not their moms and, and dads. And for that, I specifically am abundantly grateful for that. So what I want to encourage you to not do if you're, a mom, if you're not a mom and dad today here, Do not downshift from this message. Do not believe the lie that the adversary might try and put in your head that this message is not for me and therefore I'm going to sit idly by and just wait until the service is over and then just go about my business. Because I hope you can see in these three examples that I have made that you are very much needed in this church. The gifts and abilities that you have can benefit a great amount of people. And the life lessons that you are learning in your specific relationship with Christ can help grow and cultivate us into the church that we were designed to be. Now moms and dads, I'm talking to you now. Let me share with you what this message will not be today. This message will not be an indictment on your character as a parent. This message will not be a judgment-filled time where I highlight your inadequacies and your failures. And it certainly will not be a time where you feel beaten up and rotten to the core. But rather, let me explain to you what I hope this message will be today. I hope this message today will be a time where you are encouraged, where you are uplifted, and you realize that you can disciple the greatest gifts that you have been entrusted by the good and perfect Father who has given you your beautiful blessings in your children. You can 
do this. And as we study the text this morning, I want to encourage you to believe that truth. Therefore, parents, I'm not joking with what I'm about to say. All right. So I need you to repeat after me like you mean it. I don't have to be a perfect parent. All right, let's try that again. I don't have to be a perfect parent. That's right, you don't because you can't be, and the good news is God hasn't asked you to be. So breathe. Relax. Because in your failures and in your shortcomings, there's a sufficient grace that is offered by Jesus Christ to pick you back up when you feel like you've been going nine rounds and you're at a knockout. You can do this if we follow the model that God has set in place in front of us. Lastly, before we dive into God's scripture today, I want to speak to the families that are facing brokenness right now. Let me encourage you that you have ruined nothing. Because either we believe that, great, that God's sufficient grace is sufficient in all things, or it's not. We either believe that the blood of Christ offers redemption and reconciliation in all things, or it doesn't. So if you're here today facing brokenness, facing anger, frustration, will you allow the healing process, the perfect healing process of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to infiltrate your heart and your mind and your soul and allow His work to take place. Healing can sometimes be painful. There can be times where it hurts worse than the injury or the sin itself. But what I want to challenge you to consider is to not force that healing, to not rush that time that God has set in place to heal, for I'm afraid there will be more irreparable damage to which it will take longer to heal. But will you allow the full restoration of the blood of Christ to wash over your brokenness? And allow his timing and his process to take its full effect. I think if you will allow that to happen, the healing effect, although painful, will reach its completion. And everything will be set back to place. Now this text that we're about to read in is called the Shema. Everybody say Shema. One more time, Shema. What this is basically talking about, why it's titled the Shema, is in the Jewish culture, this is basically laying a foundation for biblical Christian family discipleship. Basically, God's word is saying, this is what, if you want to have a family that is pursuing after Christ and all the good things that he offers and everything that you have been created for, this is the model in which you're called to ask to follow. This is the model that you are wanting to raise and cultivate a family that is unapologetically pursuing after the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and therefore everything that follows. Unapologetically. So if you're here today and you're interested in knowing more about this model that God offers us for our family discipleship, well, I'm so thankful you're here because whether you realize it or not, you're here by a divine appointment, whether in person or online. And I want you to poise yourself this question, God, why do you have me here today? I believe if you ask yourself that question, we're able to be more intrigued and focused on what that answer actually is. So today, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to unpack uh, four points today from the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5, and then we're going to start with the first point, all right? 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The first point is this, gospel conversations with intentionality. Now, moms, dads, before we unpack this thing, what I need you to understand is we're going to look at four concentric circles concentric circles that build upon themselves that if we don't get to the first point and agree on the first point, the other three fall short and become moot. So when we talk about this intentionality, it's, it speaks of an action that is required of us. Now, moms and dads, I want to be very, very uh, clear and simplistic with what I'm about to say. You occupying the role of a mom and a dad is a role that will be given very little credit, very great ridicule, but has the ultimate purpose in raising the next generation of his church. But it is not the most important role that you play. So what I want to challenge you to do today, and this is something that is very foreign, I'm sure, to many of you, because as parents, we're kind of uh, groomed to think about everybody else. Think about all the other responsibilities, all the other details, all the other monotonous things in our life to the point where at the end of our to-do list, we are the last one to be considered. And by that time, we're just dog tired and have no more energy to do it. So what I want to give you an opportunity today, and rather permission, and this isn't a trap, so don't be like, okay, is he... Is he about to trap me into something? What I want to consider you to do and give you permission to do is think about you and your relationship with Christ only for this moment. Not you and your job, not you and your kids, not even you and your spouse. I want you to think about you and your relationship with Christ only. Are we there? In order for the family model of discipleship that God has laid out in the Shema to be effective and to be everything that it was meant to be, you as an individual son or daughter of the king have got to have an intentional time with the Lord daily. Intentional time with the Lord that is uninterrupted, that's not considering about everything else on your to-do list, but a time where you can be refined and refueled and ready to take on the day that is to come. Because if we can't understand that first concentric circle and get to a point where we're allowing ourselves to spend time as a son or daughter in his word, the rest is going to fall. You must, moms and dads, you must focus on your relationship with Christ first before anything else. Because although being a mom and a dad is a great calling, what's more important is being a son or a daughter of the king. And therefore, you must focus on this with intentionality there must be a time that you set aside daily to be with him to glean from his word to learn from him and to better prepare and serve your spouse and serve your kids and serve the occupation that God has planted you to be an extension of his gospel to your co-workers so moms and dads what does that time look like for my wife it's early in the morning Before anybody else gets up, she's up making a cup of coffee with a super loud Nespresso machine. You know, getting the frother out, you know, just acting like a barista, putting in caramel, whipped cream, cherry. And I'm like, where's mine? And black coffee, the Keurig's over there, sweetheart. Don't worry about it. And she sits quietly in the comfort of her home, spends time with her father. Before she can think about anything that regards to me. 
anything that regards to her beautiful two blessings, anything that regards to her occupation, or any of the hundred of other things that fall on her to-do list. She sets that time aside because she knows everything else will fall short if she doesn't. For me, it's at the end of the day. It's after the kids have gone down to bed. It's after I've gotten some schoolwork done. It's at the time where I'm just recounting the day that I've had with my father. Thinking about the things that he presented to me that I took advantage of. Things that he presented to me that I fell short in. It's a time that's filled with gratitude. And it's a time that's filled with cultivating an opportunity for another day to serve him. Moms and dads, if you are not individually cultivating a relationship with God, your marriage will fall short. Your parenting will fall short. It's as if he says, you want to be a better son or daughter? Love me. Work on loving me. You want to be a better mom and dad? Work on loving me. You want to be a better husband or wife? Work on loving me. Can you imagine that? The creator of the universe who has every opportunity to tell us whatever we need to do. And he says, work on loving me. Because in that moment, it's going to better serve you in the many roles that I've called you and created you for. It's interesting that he doesn't say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Work on memorizing the Ten Commandments. And then repeat those to your kids and work on them to make sure they understand the Ten Commandments. He starts with the word love. Because when we pursue God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, I think what we'll find is that every other area that we are struggling in will fall into place. The ability to set aside intentional time with our Father is one that we should not undervalue, one that we should not push to the side or on the back burner, but it should be a priority to you, to where you are unapologetically telling your spouse, I need to be with my Father first. You are unapologetically telling your kids, I need to spend time in God's Word first. So that I can better serve you. Gospel conversations with intentionality. Let's continue reading. Verses 6 and 7. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Point number two, gospel conversations with repetition. Gospel conversations with repetition. Now, what I love so much about these two verses is the simplicity that God is giving to us on how we should do this. It's like he is an ethereal. He's like, he understands that we live in an actual world filled with an actual schedule of things to do. And what God is creating and encouraging us to do is, hey man, I understand. There's opportunities for you to weave my truths in every area that you are filling your schedule with. Now, a couple caveats I want to give you. Two groups of people that I found when it comes to these times of uh, Bible studies. What I love so much is that if you're a family here today, that you are able to um, find a routine every day or once, once a day in a week at a certain time where you are able to sit in God's Word together as a family, man, that's incredible I'm very proud of you. I want to encourage you to continue to do that faithfully, and that is a wonderful thing. But if you're anything like me and my family, we've come to find out that if we try and set a certain time in a day, in a week, it seems as if the entire universe is out to get us. 
It seems as if everything that could go wrong during that time to be in God's word intentionally as a family does. Practices get moved there, sicknesses fall on those days, or our conversation and communication are so bad, the last thing we really want to do is spend time in God's word. But what I want you to understand is God's like, I understand that. I understand the challenges that you can face with the hecticness of your schedule. So what he's not doing is he's not saying, okay, I need you to take away these things and fill them with me. Because one of the greatest things about our church is that we are an active and a thriving church in the community of Signal Mountain in Chattanooga. Hear me well, I'm not discouraging you from like sacrificing the things that you enjoy to do or the things that your kids enjoy to do because they've been gifted by God to do those things. What I'm challenging you to do is look for an opportunity to reorient your schedule and weave in the truths of God on your way to practices, after a ball game, as you take a family walk, as you drive on the car. We all know you're free Uber drivers, don't get me wrong, all right? Take advantage of the time that you have in the car. Take advantage in the time when you have a family walk. One of my favorite things with my daughter Hadley is at the end of each day, I I come in, I tuck her in, and and we start praying. I I ask her, you know, who do you want to pray for? And she gives me a list of people. And I say, hey, what are you thankful for today? The other day she said, I'm thankful for Annie's bunnies. I'm like, you know what, that's a good organic healthy snack i'm so glad you're thankful for that she goes thanks dad can i have a sucker i'm like no you can't it's bedtime you can't have a sucker what is happening but in those moments we took advantage of a time where she was ready for bed it was in the calmness and the stillness and the end of the day we had an opportunity after a crazy day to reorient a time to centralize around god you're repeating conversations to your kids all the time. Let me, let me see if I can guess a couple. Maybe, uh, uh, hey, what are your grades like? Hey, how about what sports are we going to play? Or maybe focusing on how to be a better athlete in those sports or how to make better grades. Or uh, the state of a bedroom. Yeah? By and large, humanity, whether adults or, or children, do not need to be told one instruction one time and then never again. This is a repetitive process. This is something that takes years. It is a long game. But the opportunities every day are there if you take advantage of them. If you cut yourself some slack, And look for an opportunity to say, okay, you know what? We've got five minutes in the car on the way to practice. Let me share with you what I learned today in my devotional. Parents, if your children do not know what your favorite memory verse is, hear me. If your children do not know what your most impactful verse of your life is, start there. Share with them what that verse means to you and why it's so important. And then just see what that conversation leads to. Now, children, students, here, here's, here's where I kind of take a little break off of mom and dad and, and come to you, all right? Like I said, from time to time throughout this, this sermon, I'm going to be speaking primarily uh, well, I'm going to be speaking primarily to the moms and dads, but from time to time I'm going to be going on tangent to, to give you an opportunity to understand, okay, how can I play? If, if family discipleship demands the entire family, where's my role to play in this? And I want, to impact, I want to share with you a story real quick about how my three-year-old daughter impacted me so great in a moment of sheer tragedy. It was the night before the Super Bowl party, uh, February 11th, Saturday night. And I had to run back to the church that evening to, to drop off some stuff in preparation for the party the next day. And in that moment, she heard I was leaving. She said, Dad, can I come with you? I said, absolutely. And Brittany was like, well, it's 50 degrees. Should I get a jacket? I said, no, we're going to take your car. My car having some mechanical issues. You've got heated seats and the DVD player. Let's go. And so we 
hopped in the car. She was in sh- sh- a t-shirt and pants. I was looking like I just walked off the beach in a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. And I was just thinking, you know, I'm going to get in the car that's heated to a heated building. No big deal. We start driving, and all of a sudden, Brittany's uh, car starts flashing warning lights. I'm thinking, this is odd. What's, what's going on here? And then they go off. And then about a mile or two down the road, it keeps flashing. To the point where as we're coming around McCoy Farms, her ignition or her gas pedal stops working. To where then the car completely just shuts off. And we're on Taft Highway, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that we were able to pull into the subway parking lot just right up the road. All the while, the temperature had dropped to a chilling 35 degrees. In a moment where we were looking forward to have some family time together, in preparation for a fun student ministry event, tragedy struck. And as a father and a pastor, my immediate response wasn't biblical. In fact, I began to feel a well of emotions of sheer fear, anger, frustration, like why is this happening? To which my sweet little daughter at three years old, who has been learning this for three weeks at her preschool, looks at me and says, Daddy, it's going to be okay. Jesus is the good shepherd. He'll protect us. And in that moment, I looked at my daughter and I said, you're exactly right. To which the Lord allowed me to figure out exactly what I needed to do. And I'll share that end of the story with you here in a second. Children and students, listen to me well. You have no idea the impact you have if you were to simply share a verse of encouragement with your parents. Your parents are working tirelessly for you. They're shaping you. They're cultivating you. They're hoping the best for you. But they're human. They have bad days too. And they need nothing more than encouragement. And your ability to share something that you've taken away from Awana, life groups, refuge, or just your daily devotional. Call me out on it. Prove me wrong. But I guarantee you, your parents will be overjoyed and very thankful for the opportunity that you took advantage of to share and repeat the promises of God's word. Verses 8 and 9. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Third point is this, gospel conversations with clarity. You know, what I've learned as as a pastor, both communicating with adults and students and children, communication is key. (laughs) Can I I get an amen on that? Communication is key. No matter if you're an adult or you're a child, being able to communicate is key. When Brittany and I were getting, when Brittany and I were engaged and... (laughs) We got married on that day. We had a journal Bible at the front desk of the entrance. And we encouraged people that attended to write down or underline a verse and then write something encouraging next to us so we can read read on it for years to come. What we found in that Bible consistently was learn to communicate. Communication is key. And although I would agree with that, I'd like to take that a little step forward or step further and say communicate with clarity is key to family discipleship did you ever got did you guys ever play that game telephone growing up where you get in a circle and one person would start the message and throughout the whole circle you're hoping that the message came out clearly but through the uh, jumble and the whispering of the conversation it always come out messed up do you remember that or You played in a game of telephone, and there was always someone who just wanted to sabotage it. And ideally, it was funny. Do you ever feel like parenting is like an unwanted, unsolicited game of telephone where you're trying to communicate a message, and they're not getting it? 
I feel like that is one of the best reasons for the knockdown, drag out arguments that happen in the Jeff Code household. I'm not understanding. Brittany's on, not understanding. Hadley's not understanding. Luke is drooling. I mean, it's just a mess. I mean, I just don't understand it. And we're all trying to communicate clearly with one another, but it's like we can't. The words that are filled in all 66 books of God's perfect and errant and infallible word is never meant to confuse or add chaos to your life. But what it does require is some focus. It requires some intentionality. It's as if God is challenging us with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might to be what like a tea bag is in a cup of tea. He's asking us not to just dip in once and then the tea is ready. He's not even asking us to dip the tea bag in twice and it's ready. What he's asking us to do is he's asking to be like a tea bag that just sits in the water and just takes in the fullness. To where that tea becomes the drink that you're wanting it, you're desiring it to be. In a world that is constantly pushing a narrative to be so focused um, on goal-oriented accomplishments, the busyness and hecticness of schedule, we have come become a culture and a society that struggles to steep and meditate in God's word. What I want to challenge you is, if you allow, forget reading a subchapter or forget reading a chapter in God's Word. Focus on two verses. Meditate on those words. Steep in the fullness of God so that you can gain the clarity that is so freely offered in His Word. I'm coming to find out that with our two kids, they're, they're created very differently. What I mean by created very differently is I have to communicate to them very differently. I have to discipline them very differently. And I have to pray for them differently. The way your children are wired beautifully in their mother's womb is meant for us to unveil and unravel but as you begin to find out, as you ask for clarity in the spiritual conversations that you have with them, that they're going to respond differently. They're going to hear things differently. What verses in God's wonderful word would speak an abundant truth to your student? For example, if you have a student who deals with anxiety, Philippians 4, 6, 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything pray through prayer and supplications, make your request known to the Lord. Speak that verse to them and ask them to respond to what they believe that means. Help them gain clarity. If you have a student today with a harsh tongue who speaks disrespectfully and ugly, talk to them about James 3. Talk about them. The power of the tongue is like a rudder to a ship or like a spark to a wildfire that at the end of it, could cause irreparable damage. See how they respond to that. Right now, Brittany and I are, are, are reciting Psalms 139, 13 and 14 over, over our sweet little girl, Hadley. We understand the challenges that she's going to face one day as a, as a growing woman in this world. But we want her to know that who formed her inward parts, who knit her together in her mother's womb. We want her to praise the Lord because she is fearfully and wonderfully made. And her soul knows it well. What verses can you repeat intentionally to your students for the hopes that they gain clarity from it? So that they can better understand it. Last point, and as we close, it's verse... Number four, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Gospel conversations alongside the body of Christ. Here today, we represent the body of Christ. 
Here today, we have individual parts of a body that makes up a whole. One part of the body cannot do without the other part. If one part of the body suffers or is in harm, the entire body suffers. But if one part of the body succeeds, the entire body succeeds. Brothers and sisters, mom and dads, families that make up the Point Church of Signal. This church, our staff, our directors, we will come alongside each and every one of you unapologetically. But we will not ever replace you as the primary disciple makers in your home. We won't do it. We can't do it even if we tried. Because think about this. When your beautiful child was being formed in your, uh, in your womb or your spouse's womb, it was as if God was knitting together certain intrinsic values and certain gifts and abilities that were meant to highlight your ability to parent them well. And if we believe that the God of the universe makes no mistakes and is inerrant and infallible in all of his ways and perfect in all of his understanding, then you are best fit to disciple your children whether you're here realizing it or not. Don't put that on me. Don't put that on Pastor Greg. Don't put that on Pastor Sam, Pastor Matt, or our wonderful children's director, Emily. Uh, Aaron, sorry. You are best fit to disciple your children because God designed it this way. And we will come alongside you and support you and encourage you and uplift you in a way that we want to celebrate the success of that part of the body that is represented here today. But we will not replace you. Parents, you can do this. You can disciple your children. You're already doing a great job of it now. Pray that you are encouraged today. Pray that you feel loved and supported today. And I pray that you're ready to leave here ready to step in the role that you have been designed for within your family household. If you're here today with heads bowed and eyes, heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and say, you know what, after going through these four points together, I don't think I have the ability to have an intentional time with the Lord because I'm convinced I don't have a relationship with Christ. I'd love to invite you to come forward. Pastor Greg is going to be down here. would love to have a conversation with you today. If you're here today and, and you want to lay your burdens and your wearies down because you are feeling like you're falling short of being the perfect that parent that you have been called to be, and you're ready to let it go and step into the Shema and fulfill the role that you have been called to fill. You have the freedom to do that today. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the truth of your word. We're so thankful for what you do for each and every one of us. And we're thankful that you give us such an awesome opportunity to disciple the next generation of your church. But not at the hindrance of our individual discipleship with you. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word and the truth that resides in it. I'm so thankful for every single one of us that are here today and online, for the families that weren't able to be here today as well. But above all else, we are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross for our sins so that we can have an opportunity to enjoy this infrastructure and live it out to the best of our ability. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said.